Hey everyone, welcome to a new video in Lanternus IB Biology Revision Series. Today we are going to look at the HL, so the higher level details of transcription and translation. So those two processes can be summed up as protein synthesis, and that's what we're going to look at today. We've already covered the SL, the standard level part, in a previous video, so be sure to watch that before. There's also an HL level video on the details of DNA replication, and today we're going to look at transcription translation. But again, make sure to watch the SL video before, because we're just covering sort of the additional information that you need to know as an HL student. So let's start by looking at transcription. In this process, where we go from DNA, we look at our DNA molecule, and then we create a mRNA, so a messenger RNA, which is single-stranded, and all this happens in the nucleus. Without covering all the information again, let's just look at what additional information we need here as HL students. So the first important thing is that when we look at DNA and when we look at how that DNA is then transcribed and we create mRNA. What's important here is that it's a bit more complicated in terms of what is actually transcribed. Because if you look at DNA, it's not that they're just a lot of genes one after another, so sequences of, of bases that code for proteins. There's also so-called non-coding regions. So non-coding regions do not code for proteins, but they're still very, very important to DNA. And when we look at genetics in a future video, that's also definitely going to be covered. Um, just two examples here of how non-coding regions are important. If you remember, there is the start codon for transcription to begin, which is AUG. And even before the start code on AUG, there is what's called a promoter region. So that is a part on the DNA molecule, which comes just before or upstream of the gene. And so this region makes it possible for our RNA polymerase, so the molecule that will synthesize the mRNA, for that to bind there. There's also a bunch of so-called transcription factors, so other molecules that help but this promoter region is central to the process of transcription, even though in the end it doesn't code for mRNA that we create. Then we get to the coding sequence. So this is where we actually make the mRNA according to what we have on the DNA. And at the end, there's also a terminator sequence. And so this gives you an idea of where those non-coding sequences might be. And it's also very important to realize here that these are important regions, for instance, because you can thus separate the different genes from another because you really want to make sure that you're doing it right when you're transcribing the DNA uh, sequence there into mRNA. And so based on these two regions and then the coding region in the middle, we can also give names to the different stages of transcription. There is, as you may already sort of tell from the regions, there's initiation, then there's elongation, where we actually elongate, so make longer, the um, mRNA molecule that we're synthesizing. And so at the end, there's then the phase of termination at the terminator region. Another important element here is once we are transcribing, once we are creating mRNA based on the DNA template, remember that there is the antisense and the sense strand. And also remember that we want the information, so the base sequence that is stored on the sense strand, the coding strand. But in order to do that, we actually need to transcribe the anti-sense strand because of complementary base pairing. Another way of putting it is that the anti-sense strand is the template. We're using it as a template to make the mRNA. And the sense strand is the coding strand. And that's actually the information that we'll, we will have in the end on the mRNA because we used the template strand and then because of complementary base pairing, we get to the same information on the mRNA as on the coding strand that wasn't transcribed with the exception that there's no T, there is U. So no thymine on mRNA, but uracil. Let's look at another important thing here. Transcription can only occur in one direction, which is called the five prime to three prime direction. What this is referring to, and also if you want to see some pictures on this, go back to the video on replication HL, because the same thing happens in replication. We can only carry out these processes in 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And what this means is that when we look at the ribose in the backbone of the RNA, we number the carbons, there are five carbons, it's a pentose sugar, and we number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
And then actually, where the fifth carbon is, we have the phosphate group of that nucleotide. At the third carbon, there's nothing, and this is where we attach the new nucleotide, so the phosphate of the next nucleotide, creating a phosphodiester bond. And that's why we can say that transcription only occurs in this 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And now we're getting into a very new thing, because something that I haven't mentioned the last time is that in eukaryotes, so, and again, if you don't remember what prokaryotes and what eukaryotes are, go back to one of our first videos. So in eukaryotes, which are all organisms that have a nucleus in their cells. Eukaryote means true core, so there is a nucleus. In those organisms, so that's everything except for stuff like bacteria, archaea, so that, those are the prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, we need to have what's called a post-transcriptional event. And what that is referring to is that once the mRNA is done, we actually need to modify it before we can send it to the ribosomes for translation. The most important process here is called splicing. And splicing is referring to a process where we get rid of non-coding sequences within the gene that we transcribed. Because actually in eukaryotes, there are small non-coding sequences even in that gene. So not just stuff like the promoter and the terminator region. The parts that we transcribed that are now not going to be in the finished, in the mature, that's what we call it, mature mRNA, those are called the introns. So the introns are going to be cut out. Those are the parts where we transcribe non-coding regions. And then the exons are actually what's going to be left. The exons are going to be expressed, so they're going to be expressed as proteins. We're going to actually going to express that part of the gene. And the introns that are intruding, we don't want them, we cut them out in this process called splicing. And what's really interesting is that in a process called alternative splicing, we can also, depending on if we need it, we can now also remove some of the exons. And so that allows us to create from the same gene, just by expressing it differently, we can create different proteins. So depending on whether a protein might be free in the cytosol or bound to a membrane, that could you know, make a difference in which exons we cut out in splicing. We can create a higher number of proteins from the same gene by this process of alternative splicing, also cutting out some of the exons potentially. Transcription can also be regulated in general by what's called epigenetics. Epigenetics means on the genes or on the genetic material. It's referring to molecules we can actually add on top of the genetic material, and you'll see why in a second. So remember how last time we said that DNA is packaged in various forms uh, to create chromatin, so to create a large mass of genetic material. And one of the ways this is done is that DNA is wrapped around histones, so that's a kind of protein for packaging. And that is called a nucleosome. That's DNA wrapped around eight histones. And so this packaging can either be very, very tight, so the DNA is very coiled, or loosely packaged depending on whether we have acetyl groups put on the genetic material here, that means that it's loosely packaged and we actually have a higher rate of transcription. Or if we have a number of methyl groups on the genetic material, which means it is more tightly packaged, supercoiled, and so that means transcription is less likely to happen here. There's a lower rate of transcription. So now that all of that's done, all the tiny nitty gritty details of transcription, let's look uh, into translation some more. And what I want to start with is actually looking more closely at the process that occurs once we send out the mRNA from the nucleus through the nuclear pores to the ribosomes, either free or bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So what happens is that we have the assemblage of the different parts that we need here. So we have the large subunit of the ribosome, the small subunit of the ribosome, our mRNA, and then finally also the first tRNA that comes in. So first, because this also happens in 5' prime to 3' prime direction, we have the small subunit of the ribosome attaching to the mRNA and moving along until it reaches the start codon AUG. Then we have actually, before we get the large subunit of the ribosome, we actually have the first tRNA that matches with its anti-codon to AUG. So we have complementary base pairing there and the tRNA binding to the mRNA. Only then does the large subunit of the ribosome come in, sort of the 
can think of it like a burger. You have the small subunit, which is the lower part of the of the bun, and then the top part. And so then the top part comes in, and we have the mRNA in there, like a I don't know lettuce or bacon strip, and then the tRNA in there as well. And all of that is called initiation. So this is the first step, initiation. And now we actually look, once all of this is assembled, we look at three different sites and they're called EPA, the E, P and the A site. And if you read it from right to left, so the wrong way, but this is actually the direction that it'll go in, it spells APE. So this is like a thing to remember and we'll get to what each site is actually responsible for. So you can think of A as the attachment site. A new tRNA will now come in and bind to the A site. It will attach again anti-codon to the codon that we have on the mRNA. And then because each of these tRNAs carries an amino acid, the amino acid that our codon on the mRNA codes for. And now we're going to bind those two amino acids together and that's called a peptide bond. This is why a protein can be called a polypeptide because we have lots and lots of peptide bonds. Then we have these two, which is then called a dipeptide, these two amino acids, on the tRNA that is in the A side. So the one on the P side will then move to the E side, exit and go and get the same amino acid again and might be back later, but for now it's gone. And the one that we had in the A side, in the attachment side, will move over into the P side. So P we can think of as standing for polypeptide because this is where we just sort of store our polypeptide chain on one of the tRNAs. Then we have the new one coming in at the A side. We attach the two amino acids on the middle one to the amino acid on this one. Now we have a tripeptide. We move it all over. We have the newest tRNA in the middle with the three amino acids bound together. A new one swoops in and this is how we continue. So we have attachment polypeptide exit, which are not the official names of these sites, but that's how you can think of it. And so this sort of cycle of events is called elongation and translocation. We're elongating our polypeptide and we're translocating the ribosomal subunits or the ribosome in itself along the mRNA. It's moving along the mRNA because we need to look at the new codons all the time. And then finally, we get to termination, which means that at the stop codon, there's actually not going to be a new tRNA moving in, but instead we're going to disassemble everything. The mRNA is set free, the ribosomal subunits detach, and we're just left with our polypeptide that we created. Two more important things on this translation process. In prokaryotes, we can actually start translation while the mRNA is still being transcribed because there's no nucleus and no nuclear membrane. It's all happening in the same area anyways, right? And so the ribosomes, which are different ribosomes in uh, prokaryotes than in eukaryotes, can already start the translation process while transcription is still going on. So it's all happening at the same time, sort of, or it can. And then in eukaryotes, that's of course not possible because we need to, as we said before, move the mRNA from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, to the ribosomes. What's also important is that in general, in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, we can actually have what's called a polysome. So that is poly means many, and that is actually referring to multiple ribosomes translating a sequence of mRNA at the same time. So that means that we're going to get multiple or the same polypeptide, the same protein, multiple times because it's happening um, um, in multiple locations at the same time. And also if we're looking at the eukaryotes, as we said before, there are free ribosomes just floating around and there are bound ribosomes which are on the endoplasmic, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so that, there's actually a difference uh, in the proteins that are made either on the free or the bound ribosomes. If you're looking at the free ribosomes, those proteins are used for intracellular purposes. So they're staying in the cell Whereas those on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, so those proteins created by bound ribosomes, those are actually usually for extracellular use, so we're sending them out of the cell. And that happens via the Golgi apparatus. Again, if you want to freshen up your knowledge of the organelles, there's also a video on that at the very beginning of the list. And what's important is that, of course, a protein is not just the long polypeptide chain. There's primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure 
for proteins. And that is also something important to look at and remember when we talk about proteins. And for that, you can also look at our video on organic compounds. We're talking about that in there as well. Otherwise, we're done now with the HL details on transcription and translation. I hope that was helpful. If there are any questions remaining, feel free to comment below. And otherwise, we're looking forward to seeing you again in the next video on our biology revision series.